Thanks everyone for being here. The talks from Professor Kahneman and from Michelle were a perfect setup to what I want to talk about. I could not have imagined a better preface. I want to talk about model-driven businesses. These are companies that are beating competitors and driving unprecedented growth and even upending entire industries by putting models at the heart of their business. Now notice that I said model-driven and not data-driven. For decades, we've heard that companies should be data-driven. The difference between models and data is now often lost in all the hype around AI, and more importantly, it's often misunderstood or overlooked by business leaders and even technical leaders. Data is static and historical. It's great for telling you what happened in the past, and it's great for things like business intelligence and reporting, but at the end of the day, it is fundamentally backwards-looking. Models, on the other hand, are predictive. They recommend decisions and actions to take, and they learn and evolve. And so models are forward-looking and adaptive. Being data-driven is like navigating using a rear-view mirror. Being model-driven is like having a GPS that tells you where to go. Now, this morning, I want to talk about the journey to become a model-driven business. And the biggest source of friction we see along that journey, the, the, the most common barrier and the source of challenges that companies face, is something that we call the model myth. It's the misconception that because models involve code and data, that a company can treat them like they've treated assets from the past, like they treat software or BI dashboards or databases using the same people and processes and technology. Models are a new, fundamentally different type of digital life. They're different in three ways. First, the materials used to make them are different. Models use computationally intensive algorithms, and so they need scalable compute and specialized hardware like GPUs. And they take advantage of a vibrant open source ecosystem that's innovating every day. Second, models, the, the, the process to make models is different. Making models is research. It's experimental, it's iterative, it's exploratory. You might try hundreds of ideas before finding one that works, and that's okay, that's encouraged. And often, breakthroughs when making models come from picking up old ideas that have been left on the shelf. And third, models' behavior is different. Models are predictive or probabilistic. They don't have correct answers, they just have better or worse answers once they're live in the wild. And nobody ever needs to retrain software, but models change as the world around them changes. Now, if this seems obvious to you, I would just ask you to take a minute to put yourself in the shoes of a business leader or even a technical leader who spent the last couple of decades focused on doing big data or enabling traditional software development. They don't have the perspective and the experience that you all have, and this concept may be very foreign to them. And until companies really grok this difference, they won't make progress on their journey. So let's talk about that journey. It's got three parts to it, getting the point, getting the people, and getting the platform. The first part of the journey is getting the point. Until a company and its leaders understand that it's urgent to become a model-driven business, they won't make progress. Why is it so urgent? Companies that are truly model-driven are automating decision-making. You heard uh, Professor Kahneman talk earlier about the power of algorithmic decision-making versus human decision-making. Models operate at machine speed, and they learn at machine speed. So compared to their competitors, companies that are running on models are making decisions faster, they're learning and improving exponentially faster, and they're making higher quality decisions by eliminating human overconfidence. Now, if your leaders don't understand that models are fundamentally different, if they're just doing big data and they're putting dashboards in front of analysts to make decisions, then they're missing the point. Unless you're a company that is truly automating your decision-making using algorithms and models, you'll soon be left behind. And if you take one thing away from my talk this morning, that's what I want you to remember. Companies are either becoming model-driven or they're going extinct. Let's talk about a couple of examples. We just heard from Netflix this morning. Now, everybody knows about the Netflix recommendation algorithm. It was a watershed moment in popularizing data science. And Netflix has said it's worth over a billion dollars a year to their business but that is nothing compared to what they went on to do next. Netflix built models not merely to recommend what content to watch, but to recommend what content to create. That's how in 2013, House of Cards became its most streamed piece of content ever. 
Netflix had committed to two seasons of House of Cards without seeing a single episode because their models of viewer preferences predicted the hit. Armed with the ability to predict the success of content, Netflix went on to make a huge investment in original content, and it's paying off. Recently, Netflix estimated their, their original Bird Box had 80 million viewers within its first month after being released. That number dwarfs viewership for the most popular content on other networks. And while cable subscribers are gradually fading away, Netflix subscribers are growing rapidly. Now, admittedly, some of this is due to other trends like cord cutting, but Netflix's subscribers dwarf other streaming services as well. They've got seven times as many subscribers as HBO Go, and as another data point, Disney just announced their uh, ESPN Plus streaming service. They're projecting to have between 8 and 12 million subscribers by the end of 2024. Meanwhile, Netflix added 9.5 million subscribers in the first quarter of 2019 alone. Now, if you had the ability to predict the success of content and you had a distribution channel where you could recommend who should watch what and when, what would you do? Netflix turned its sights on the film industry. They made 82 feature films last year. By comparison, Warner Brothers, the most prolific traditional studio, made just 23, and Disney made just 10. Think about that just for a minute. Four years ago, Netflix was a $20 billion streaming company. Today, they are a $160 billion content creator. Not content merely to dominate their market, Netflix has gone on to turn the entire film industry on its head. We're in New York, so I want to talk a little bit about finance. Renaissance and Bridgewater are two legendary hedge funds. And they're both infamously secretive, but pretty much the only thing they have shared publicly is that they run on models. Renaissance's medallion fund generated annualized returns of over 70% a year from 1994 to 2014. That's the longest continuous returns of any hedge fund in history. And while Renaissance won't say much about their strategies, pretty much the only thing they will say is that all their strategies depend on models. Now, lots of hedge funds have models, but Renaissance runs on them. The mathematician founder, Jim Simons, described that commitment as slavishly using the models and doing whatever the hell they say to do. My Domino co-founders and I came from another hedge fund. We came from Bridgewater. Bridgewater is the largest hedge fund, and they've become popular recently because their founder, Ray Dalio, wrote a best-selling book. Now, the book actually doesn't talk at all about investing strategies, but when Dalio does speak about them, he describes an unambiguously model-driven approach. Bridgewater specifies their investment decision-making criteria in algorithms, which allows them to make more informed and less emotional decisions. Now, with all the hype around AI and machine learning, I want to take a minute to just note that not all models have to be built with machine learning. Bridgewater's models are based on macroeconomic rules that can be described and articulated in plain English. Dalio described that process for building their models as forming a deep understanding of cause and effect relationships, writing that down, and then translating that thinking into algorithms. The point is, the rewards of being a model-driven business come from having the discipline and rigor to run your business on algorithmic decision-making. Simply doing machine learning isn't sufficient, and it's, in, in some cases, not even necessary. So how's the model-driven approach working out for Renaissance and Bridgewater? Well, the average lifespan of a hedge fund is about five years. Funds die all the time. In some years, more than 1,000 firms shut down. Meanwhile, Bridgewater and Renaissance have been generating market-beating returns for decades. And they aren't just surviving, they are thriving. Bridgewater has returned more money to its investors than any hedge fund in history. And in 2018, the top two highest gaining hedge funds were, of course, Renaissance and Bridgewater. It is not a coincidence that these two firms are model-driven down to their core DNA. When a company harnesses this kind of power and creates this kind of flywheel, nobody can compete. McKinsey recently did a study where they estimated the impact of data science on the global economy. And they found that over the next 10 years, leading adopters can expect to see a 120% increase in cash flow uh, compared to their competitors. Meanwhile, those who are lagging behind can expect a 23% decline. Is everybody getting the point here? If you aren't becoming a model-driven business, you'll soon be losing to one. And until companies realize that, they're not going to make progress on the journey. Now, over the next couple days, we've got talks from Stitch Fix and Airbnb. We just heard from Netflix. And we've got a great panel tomorrow with leaders from KOTU and Point72, which are two hedge funds that are doubling down on data science. But you don't have to be a trendy tech company or a finance firm to become a model-driven business. We've got a story I want to share now from one of our customers. They are a 100-year-old business in an industry that you all depend on every day, but probably never think about. So let's take a look. 
The dealer tire has been around in one iteration or another for about 100 years now. It's a family owned business located in Cleveland, Ohio. We're taking the 100 years of experience and expertise in tires and we're pairing that with a data lens. We get to think about the business in ways that no one else is really thinking about it. Um, and we get to try and solve problems in new and creative ways. The one example is a product that the data science team has built called Tire Trigger. Tire Trigger is a, an ensemble of five different models. Those five models really answer two separate questions. How many miles does this person drive per day? And then when, in mileage, will this vehicle need tires replaced? We can say, what is the, the actual monetary lift of engaging these individuals at the right time? Those that engage with the email, we're driving about a 67% increase over the control group, those that we did not engage with. The models are transforming our business. The Domino Data Science Platform has really allowed us to focus on the problem at hand, to focus on the customer, the domain, the data, most importantly, instead of some of these other things, like how are we going to move this to production? What are we going to do once this model's built? We want to be the industry leader in, in analytics. Tire Trigger was obviously the, the start of that, and we want this ultimately to be a core competitive advantage for dealer tire. Isn't that great? How many people here after seeing that want to bet that dealer tire is going to absolutely crush its competitors? Yeah, 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 it's good. Here's, Here's my favorite, my favorite part about the Dealer Tire story, is the data science team at Dealer Tire is the only team other than sales that owns a revenue target. That's how you know they're treating models with urgency, and that's how you know they get the point. Step two in the journey is getting the people. Who are the people that you need if you want to truly run your business on models? Well, we're witnessing the emergence of two camps right now with divergent answers to that question. The first camp is betting on citizen data scientists. Gartner describes a citizen data scientist as someone who builds models, but whose primary job isn't in statistics or analytics. These are people, uh, could, could be software engineers or business analysts, and often they're using drag and drop tools that offer to automate a lot of data science work. So it's like an easy button for data science. Now, some companies expect that over the coming years, a majority of their work will be done by citizen data scientists. The argument is that citizens are more abundant and less expensive than experts. With Domino, we think this is absolutely bonkers. We are in the other camp. The rewards of being a model-driven business are massive. They are nothing short of existential. But there is no easy button. You need experts. Think about the companies we've just talked about, Renaissance and Bridgewater and Netflix and Dealer Tire. Do you think the, the, the models at those companies are built by people who don't have expertise in statistics? I, I'm very, very skeptical. O'Reilly recently published a research report uh, they called their State of Machine Learning Adoption in the Enterprise and surveyed 11,000 professionals in this industry from around the world. And one of their main findings was that if you look at companies that have had models in production successfully for at least a few years, 73% of those models are built by data scientists, not by software engineers or by business analysts. Now, this seems intuitive. And yet, I think one of the reasons that some companies aren't making more progress on their journey to become model-driven is that they're trying to build capacity with citizens, hoping to find a shortcut instead of investing in experts. And I think this misguided path ultimately stems back to the model myth. Because if you don't understand the ways that models are subtly different and nuanced, then from a distance, making models can look a lot like making software or even querying data. But just because you know how to write Python code or SQL doesn't give you the expertise you need to do data science. You all have a unique blend of skills and abilities. You are statisticians, you are programmers, you are guardians of the scientific method. And I think that's the thing that really bothers me the most about the citizen data scientist argument, is that it undervalues what you all do. It tries to take the the complexity, the sophistication, the nuance of your discipline and sort of package it up into a you know, drag and drop wizard or a GUI for automated machine learning. What, what are we gonna have next? Are we gonna have Clippy for data science? <laughs> but, I'm glad I got a couple of laughs. I, was, I thought people might not remember Clippy. I wasn't sure that <laughs> was good. No, seriously, so look, uh, uh, drag and drop tools are gonna be great for a certain set of things. I think they're gonna do a lot to enhance traditional reporting use cases. Uh, things like sales forecasting and marketing campaign design. But think about the models at the heart of your business, models that directly impact revenue, customer experience, or the power breakthroughs that keep you ahead of competitors. 
Things like predicting credit risk or discovering new drugs or classifying security threats. For models like that, you're gonna need experts with training, skill, and wisdom. Think about other disciplines of work that has high stakes. Think about things like medicine and law and accounting. We have experts doing those jobs. At Domino, we had a little bit of fun thinking about this analogy, and uh, we made another short video that I wanna show you I think you're gonna get a kick out of. Can you believe it's hashtag tax time again? Always sneaks up on you. Right. Okay, well, we now need to determine the impact of the new ASC 606 tax code on our revenue recognition as we file. Yeah, don't sweat it. No, I'm on it. I've got this new tax buddy software that uses drag and drop. Makes it all super easy. Okay, let's get started. How much of this space would you consider office space? 100%. This is our office. Gotcha. Moving on. And how many dependents do you have? This patient has appendicitis and needs surgery immediately. Scalpel. Move! There's still time. Come on, breathe. Breathe! Get off of me! Yeah, we'll have the contract over to you by the end of the day. Great. Thanks. Weddings are so expensive, and we still don't have a photographer yet. I know we can save a little money. My Uncle Leo just got that new iPhone. It's pretty much a professional camera, right? I love Uncle Leo, but are you sure? It'll be fine. Uncle Leo! Anthony! Good to see you. Great wedding! Thank you, thank you. I brought the prince. Oh, let's see him. Come on. I hope you don't mind. I had a little fun with Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I don't want to brag, but they're pretty good, right? <laughs> oh, oh tears of joy. Uh. Feel free to use that if you want. Uh, you don't have to give us credit or anything. Like if someone asks you if a citizen data scientist can do your job, you can just ask them, you know, when was the last time you went to a citizen surgeon? Let's see if that lands. Um, okay, on a, on a more serious note, look, uh, citizen data scientists and drag and drop tools, I think they're gonna create a lot of value over the coming few years. Uh, just like lifeguards and personal tax software, they are great in the right situations. But to become a model-driven business, you need experts. And if you take a second thing away from my talk this morning, that's what I'd like you to remember. Running your business on models requires experts. Okay, so let's check back in. We've talked about creating a sense of urgency around becoming model-driven, and we talked about getting expert data scientists to lead that charge. Step three of the journey is about enabling those experts at scale. Model-driven businesses use new platforms that empower data scientists and allow them to manage data science as a core organizational capability. Remember the model myth. If you try to take the platforms and the technology you've used for managing assets in the past, like data or BI or software, and you try to graft them onto data science, it won't work. To understand why and understand what's needed instead, we've got to look back at those three reasons that models are different. First, the materials used to make models are different. They need more scalable compute. They need flexible access to open source ecosystem packages. And so model-driven companies need agile infrastructure that allows them to accelerate experimentation. Second, the process used to make them is different. Making models is experimental and iterative and exploratory. And oftentimes, a breakthrough will come by picking up someone else's old work. So model-driven companies need collaborative R&D environments that allow them to facilitate iteration track work, and spark breakthroughs. And third, models' behavior is different. Models are probabilistic, and they change as the world around them changes. So model-driven businesses need new ways of governing data science work, including reviewing, quality controlling, and monitoring it. Each of these three unique traits of models calls for a new technological capability to enable a company to manage data science at scale. Different materials demand agile infrastructure. A different process demands collaborative R&D environments. And different behavior demands new ways of governing data science work. This is our North Star for Domino. 
one platform that unifies all the capabilities that a company needs in order to become a model-driven business. To give you a sense of what that looks like in practice, we've got one more story from one, story from one of our customers. They have become a model-driven business with expert data scientists at scale. Let's take a look. Red Hat is the world's largest open source software company, and we sell subscriptions for enterprise Linux, um, which is open source operating system. In order to stay ahead of our competition, ahead of the trends, we need to use data science to help become more model driven and to predict where we need to be going. Modeling has been transforming the way Red Hat's been doing business. Being able to understand how people are thinking about our own organization, how people are behaving within our own organization, how our software is going to behave, all of that allows us to become more efficient. We have a new tool called Red Hat Insights. What it'll be doing is uh, analyzing a customer's server information, for example, and then trying to predict and diagnose what possible problems could be using the data on the back end. The best data science outputs, I believe, come from lots and lots of collaboration. Domino has given us a platform that all of our data scientists can come together, have access to the hardware they need to do their job, but also have a place that they can collaborate and work with each other to deliver even a better model. The data science community asked us for this. They wanted this environment. Our investment in Domino has really paid off probably a return of around 10x in terms of efficiency of our data science community. Our data science platform helps bring modeling projects to life. That's what it does for us. Great. Uh, two themes that really stood out to me from listening to the Red Hat story, the things that they got tremendous value from, were flexible infrastructure and collaboration. Now, I talk to hundreds of model-driven businesses, and those two themes come up over and over again. They are not unique to Red Hat. In fact, just going back to uh, Renaissance, one of the hedge funds I, I mentioned earlier, uh, at a 2010 talk at MIT, the founder Jim Simons was asked what did they do to make uh, research successful at Renaissance, and he said the two most important things they did were first, giving people a way to have shared context to understand what everyone else is working on, and then second, giving people great, easy to use infrastructure. Now for Domino, these are more than just themes. These are two guiding core principles that have informed every decision we've made in how we built our platform. And that's important because not everyone, not all platforms are doing the same thing. Providing flexible infrastructure means providing open infrastructure. And increasingly, we're seeing platforms come to market that are tightly tied to a vendor's underlying infrastructure. These are ways of selling more compute or more storage or more Spark or Hadoop nodes. And we think that if the goal of your platform is to sell more of your own infrastructure, then you aren't putting the needs of data scientists first and foremost. And in a similar vein, we're seeing a growing number of products that are really aimed at an individual data scientist and, and his or her use cases. Now, we all know data science is a team sport. And so if you're just enabling an individual data scientist, but you aren't doing anything to help teams and organizations collaborate and build and share knowledge, then you're not going to get the job done. We are 100% convinced that model-driven businesses need platforms that enable collaboration and open, flexible infrastructure. And we don't think anybody is doing that better than Domino is. Now, that brings me to the part of the morning I'm most excited about. We're going to talk about products. Today, we've got new functionality to show you in each of the three areas where technology enables model-driven business flexible open infrastructure, collaborative R&D, and governing data science work. And to show you more about this, please welcome our chief data scientist, Josh Paduska. Thanks, Nick. Hey, everybody. It's really great to be with you today, and I have some very exciting product announcements to share with you. But before I get into it, in order to understand where we're going, it helps to know where we've been. Five years ago, when we launched Domino, we were the first data science platform to offer vertical and horizontal scaling compute to meet the unique needs of data science teams. We were also the first data science platform to incorporate Docker. We actually put Docker into the Domino platform back in 2013, before it was even at version one. From the beginning, openness has been a core principle for us at Domino. We don't want to lock data scientists into one way of thinking or working. And we want you to have the flexibility of libraries 
packages and languages that work best for you. We also want you to have access to open source innovations as soon as they become available. As we built our container orchestration and management functionality, we looked at the existing ecosystem of tools for something we could leverage. We considered Mesos, Swarm, and Kubernetes, but back then everything was still really immature, and we weren't sure if any of these would stabilize or even survive. So we built our own compute grid. It was the only way we could ensure that our customers would have a great experience. That was several years ago. Today is a different story. It's clear Kubernetes has won, and our customers want us to support it. All right, so that's our backstory. Now on to my first big product announcement of the day. And this one's around Domino's open infrastructure. Over the last year, our engineers have been working on a complete ground up rebuild of the Domino compute grid. And it incorporates all the lessons we've learned over the last five years about what it takes for, from infrastructure and systems to run modern data science organizations at scale. And it's built on the rock solid open foundation of Kubernetes. Now there's a lot going, under, going on under the hood of Domino's new Kubernetes-based compute grid. I'm gonna share with you some details, but as I do, you might ask yourself, all right, this is great, but what's in it for me? So before I share the details, let me mention the three main benefits we see our customers getting from this new compute grid. First, your IT teams are gonna love it. Domino's gonna be easier to install and administer, and it'll interact better with, with existing tool ecosystems. Second, you're gonna see more new features coming from Domino because our engineers are not gonna be tied up managing our homegrown compute grid. And third, and by far most important, Kubernetes means openness. Unlike some of our competitors, we're not trying to lock you in to one cloud provider or underlying infrastructure. Having the Domino platform run natively on Kubernetes means that your data science work and your data science platform is future-proofed ready for the unknown innovations that we all know are gonna come in the next couple years. Okay, let's take a look under the hood at this new compute grid. It supports the four native data science workloads, starting with batch jobs, doing model training and computational experiments. Then we have interactive workspaces where we do research, exploration, and discovery using tools like Jupyter and RStudio. Next, there's apps. V that are deployed via persistent servers that expose these web-based apps in an interactive way to business users. Uh, these are the types of apps that are built with Shiny, Dash, and Flask. And last, model-based APIs, real-time APIs with low latency and high availability. I want to emphasize that the new compute grid does a lot more than simply running data science workloads on Kubernetes. We've taken the time to productize everything needed to run an enterprise scale data science organization. We started with an underlying enterprise infrastructure where all services can be configured to run with high availability and load balanced horizontal scalability. Next, we added enterprise security, covering secret management, volume encryption, and network security. Then we added resource management, where, where we have image building and caching so that your workloads start really quick, even if you have lots of packages. Also with partitioning, resource partitioning and access control, so you can control who has the rights to use certain compute resources. We also added auto scaling to save you compute spend and resource usage. And we have automated cleanup so that your clusters stay healthy even when you're starting and stopping thousands of jobs. Finally, the compute grid works hand in hand with Domino's reproducibility engine. We configured every part of the new platform to work under, under the umbrella of reproducibility. What you see here are just a couple of examples with file sync and results capture. Our Saga engine for auto tracking so you can reproduce past actions and log and usage tracking, which aggregates logs and statistics around CPU and memory usage. All that you see here is built on our core philosophy of flexibility and openness, as Nick articulated. If your model technology is intrinsically tied to an infrastructure provider, 
or if you're not giving your data scientists the flexibility they need to leverage different languages and packages, then you're not setting up your organization to be model driven. Okay, next we have a short demo for you to show you just how rock solid this new compute grid is and how easy it makes it to run really large uh, data science workloads at scale. So to give you a sense of how this looks, we simulated the day in the life of a data science organization and uh, which has hundreds of researchers doing work simultaneously. Uh, when we run the demo, what you're gonna see along the top are gonna be four graphs showing the volume of workloads broken down by those four uh, native data science workload buckets. And along the bottom, you're gonna see a big graph showing the number of active cores in our, in our cluster. Okay, let's go ahead and run that video now. This is gonna play in fast forward mode. So we have a number of persistent apps and APIs that are always on serving requests. At the start of the day, data scientists come online and they kick off interactive and batch work, workloads. The compute grid doesn't skip a beat. It scales up the number of cores to meet demand. Around lunch, some researchers stop doing their work. And at the end of the day, APIs get decommissioned, batch jobs complete, and the workspaces get stopped. As that happens, Domino scales down the number of machines needed to save you resources and compute spend. Remember, unlike infrastructure companies, our goal is to save you costs. All right, so there you have it. That was our first announcement, a sneak peek at Domino's new compute grid. It's pretty cool. I know internally we're very excited about it. So the question you might be asking now is, all right, this is great. When can I get my hands on that new technology? This new compute grid will be shipping this fall. Okay, that's not the only announcement I have for you. My next one is around enabling data scientists collaborative R&D processes. Because data science is iterative and experimental, as we do our research, it can be very easy to run into problems when you're trying to organize all that's going on in your research activities. That's why we as data scientists spend so much time trying to track and organize and collect all the artifacts related to our experiments and our research. We don't want to lose out on insights and we don't want to have to repeat work. And we know that the best data science discoveries happen in teams. So as you're scaling your organizations, you want to be able to provide your teams knowledge and context needed to work together collaboratively. If you don't offer that, it's just way too easy to miss out on the spark that would ignite the next innovation. The lab is the area in, data science, in the Domino data science platform where our data scientists go to do all this interactive, uh, iterative research. And we have two new breakthroughs to share with you today in the lab. Uh, I know all the data scientists out there, you're gonna love them. Uh, they're called the experiment manager and the activity feed. We built experiment manager and activity feed so that you can do collaborative research better and faster than ever before. And we have a live demo for you that we'd like to share uh, about showing, these, showing off these two new features. To help with that, I'm gonna welcome up two friends, uh, one of our product managers, Avinash Joshi, and one of our engineers, Neola Nelson. Good morning. Thanks, Josh. So Domino's experiment manager saves data scientists time by helping them track their progress and find past work. Now, to show you how that looks like, we have a sample project loaded up. The goal of this project was to solve a problem faced by many companies, fortunately not us, is how to reduce customer churn. So to, do, to do this, uh, I, was, I was tasked to build a model that could predict the likelihood of a customer churning in a given time period. To do that, I tried a bunch of experiments with multiple data sets and algorithms. In the past, I would, have, I would maintain all this data about files and data sets using deletion file names and folder structures. How many of you can relate to something, to your product, project's folder looking like this? Frustrating, isn't it? I would also run, track experiments that I'm running in a spreadsheet by manually copying key metrics, like my hyperparameters or the accuracies that I'm generating. Now, as you can imagine, this manual process is extremely error prone. Domino's experiment manager does all of this for me automatically. Each row in the table represents an experiment that I've run in the past. Let's start an experiment to train a cross to train a classification model. Sorry. Okay. 
Now, even while that's running, I can quickly explore the results of my past experiments. I seem to have a mix of model training experiments, ETL experiments, and feature selection experiments. To keep myself organized, I can group my experiments. For this project, the groups that I've chosen are data wrangling, feature selection, and the different algorithms that I've used for training the model. Let's dig into one of the, one of the groups, of the model training groups, by, digging in, by filtering down to the random forest. Experiment manager records metrics for different experiments and renders them as separate columns. This gives me a quick view into how did this subset of experiments perform. Now I can sort on this accuracy measure to find the best experiment that I have had in this subset. Now I can dig deeper into that experiment by pulling up its details. I can see the logs that were produced and the results that were generated in this experiment, which would be an ROC curve. Now imagine you need to rerun this experiment to validate it. In absence of the experiment manager, you would first have to track down the author of the experiment, ask them to send over their code and data, and the details of the environment that they used to run this experiment, and then hope that they got it right. Domino's reproducibility engine captures all this information for you automatically. It captures the hardware tier and the, and the software environment that was used, and, it also, and also the data sets that were imported along with any external dependencies that were used for this experiment. This saves me and my collaborators tons of time in, find, in understanding past work and not reinvent the wheel. Taking a look at the AUC column again, I see that there was a huge upswing in my accuracy between the experiment numbers 81 and 82. I want, I'd like to know why. What did I change to make this happen? So I can access the comparison view to see what were the changes between these two experiments. I see that I have dropped a feature called product price, which doesn't seem to do much for customer churn, which improved the accuracy. This valuable piece of information has become part of the system of record of my project automatically. Domino also allow, allows my team lead and my collaborators to come into the project and understand what's going on. Niola, why don't you show how that works? Thanks, Avinash. As Avinash was saying, the experiment manager allows data, science to, data scientists to run tons of experiments as they work. But we all know that as teams grow, it becomes even more important to understand what's going on. Collaboration increases, it's easy to get lost. For example, I'm the tech lead on Avinash's customer churn project. Uh, we got a distributed team, and I've been out of the office for the past few days, I don't know what's going on, and I need to get caught up. The experiment manager is the perfect place for me to get a quick overview of what's been happening while I've been away. I can see all the experiments that my team has been running. Uh, I noticed that we pulled in more data to train our model, and I'm curious as to why. So I'm going to dig into the results of this experiment. Uh, it looks like we were overfitting the model. So that explains the decision that my team made to increase the training sample size. I can also filter down into conversations in a project to get a sense of the insights generated so far. The goal of this particular project is to generate a robust customer churn prediction model with an AUC of above 0.8. Uh, I can see uh, by this conversation here that Avinash has tried a bunch of tree-based methods in order to attempt to improve the model. All right, so we've done a lot, but is it working? Are we getting any closer to our goal? So I need some help to step back. Uh, I'm gonna flip back to the experiment manager, which Avinash was talking about earlier, and take a look at the new timeline view. Uh, this timeline view allows data scientists to select metrics, which they want to have automatically plotted as a time series, so they can get a sense of trends in a project, uh, you know, at a glance. The AUC curve is what I'm particularly interested in as it pertains to my goal for this project to determine whether it's going to be successful or not. Uh, and that's the pink line up here. You can see that it's flatlining at 0.6. And uh, well, 0.6 is below our goal of 0.8. So this worries me. 
Uh, it makes me believe that my team may be, might be a bit stuck. Uh, so I'm gonna raise a blocker. Um, and I'm gonna type a little message in to, the, to let my stakeholders know uh, that this critical project may be at risk. All right, so activity feed helped me get caught up even though I have been out of the loop. And the timeline view let me gauge the state of what's been going on without having to spend the precious time of my colleagues. All right, thanks everybody. That's activity feed. And back to Josh. Thanks, Neola. So we saw from Avinash the experiment manager. We saw from Neola the activity feed, and then a little bit of the experiment manager also to help her out with that timeline view. I like to think of activity feed as the perfect complement to experiment manager. Together, it provides me as a data scientist a collaborative lab notebook for all my work. And the best news about these two features that you just saw is they're shipping in Domino today. The compute grid that we've talked about, the collaborative R&D functionality that we've talked about, together these make Domino the best place to do, to do data science work. Across the world, so many companies are standardizing with Domino for their data science research and production. In fact, one of our companies told us, if it's not in Domino, it doesn't exist. Let's see, clicker. There we go. As you can tell, we're going to keep innovating in these core and foundational areas of the Domino platform. But while others in this space have been trying to catch up to us, we've been looking to the future. And we've been collaborating closely with our customers to come up with new and innovative features that are going to make all of us even more model driven. And that brings me to my final product announcement of the day, one I'm really excited about, and it's around model governance. If you use Domino, all of your data science work is in one place. And as you think about it, that provides you with an unprecedented opportunity to have transparency into your entire portfolio of data science work and that portfolio's health. Last fall, we shipped the control center. It was aimed at IT leaders, and it gave them visibility into compute usage and spend. Today, we're announcing a significant expansion of the control center with new features for data science leaders and frontline managers. In my role at Domino, I get to talk to data science leaders from all over the world. And I like to ask them a question. What keeps you up at night? And it's been very interesting. The answers they give me consistently fall into one of three categories. How many of you can relate to one of these? I need help tracking projects. I need help tracking production assets, and I need help establishing a culture of following best practices. To elaborate on that a bit, let me share a story that a vice president of analytics told to me back in January. He works at a wealth management company, and his CEO asked him a very simple question. How many data science projects do you have in flight right now? By the way, how many of you could answer that question? He told his CEO, I think it's about 10 to 15, but I'm going to check and get back to you. He had to literally walk around his office, pen and notepad in hand, going person to person to conduct his survey. And guess how many projects he found at the end? 58. <laughs> he was shocked, and so was his CEO. So Avinash and I will now give you a live demo of these new features that I'm talking about for data science leaders in the control center. As a data science leader, I would start my day by looking at the project portfolio dashboard. Across the top, I'm presented with a list of my in-flight projects broken down by the stages in the data science lifecycle. And these stages are configurable to whatever matches my organization's lifecycle. I can scroll through this dashboard and quickly get status updates on all of my projects. I can filter on blocked projects and see that one of the blocked projects is the customer churn project that Avinash and Neola were working on. Now, I don't know all the details of this project, but from the dashboard, I can see that it's almost across the finish line with 75% of its goals complete. I can dive into the project uh, from this dashboard and find out some more details about it. 
So it looks like it's in the R&D phase, and the last goal to be accomplished is to get an AUC model of at least 0.8. I really like this new goals feature uh, from Domino. If all I have is the project stage, that doesn't tell me a lot about progress because as we all know, data science projects don't progress linearly through stages of the data science lifecycle. But when combined with goals, it gives me a, but, a much better indication of project progress. To get a little bit more background, I can click on the activity feed and see what led up to this blocker being raised. Now that I have all this information, my bearings are straight, I'm gonna suggest a course of action. I'm gonna recommend that the customer churn team try a new modeling approach that they haven't tried yet, a deep net. I recently hired a deep learning expert, but she resides on another team. Her name is Sushmita. I'm gonna tag her in a comment here and ask her to help mentor the customer churn team as they try to get better accuracy. As a data science leader, being able to see all my projects in one view to spot barriers to, to progress and remove those barriers is so important to me as I need to deliver on my commitment to our customers. Okay, that brings me to the second need of data science leaders, which is tracking production assets. I can do this with the help of the assets portfolio dashboard. When I think about my assets that are in production, two things come to mind. One, I want to make sure my customers are getting value from the things we put into production. And two, I want to make sure that my team is maintaining those in a proper way. To help gauge customer satisfaction, I can look at data usage or asset usage. Let's take, for example, the first asset in the dashboard, the audience selection app. I know this is an important app, big decisions are made off of it, but as, as I look at the usage trend, it's trending down and usage is unusually low lately. I can find out who the customer stakeholder is for this app, it is Rob. I'm gonna follow up with Rob to find out what's going on. As I look at how my team is doing and maintaining these production assets, I can take, for example, the price prediction API. It's one of the most used assets on this dashboard with thousands of calls to its model every day. I can look at the last updated column and see that this model has not been refreshed in two months. That could be concerning. To get more details on this, I can click on the versions number and I can see a detailed history of model refresh. It looks like this model is typically refreshed every couple of weeks, so yeah, a two month lag is not good. I'm gonna follow up with the model owner, and I can check the dashboard to see who that is. It's Dan in this case, and make sure that this model is giving good, good output to my customers. Being able to get ahead of potential production problems like this is gonna save me a lot of headaches as I prevent these things from spiraling out of control. The third need that we hear from data science leaders is around best practices and culture change. To help with this, I can turn to the data science health dashboard. This tracks three metrics of organizational health, project throughput, reuse, and collaboration. On the project throughput graph, I can see how my team is doing at getting, putting into production the cadence of delivering on their work of uh, uh, both models and research projects. And this uh, dashboard shows me one of my favorite graphs, which is the stage-wise breakdown. As you can see, this aggregates the time my teams are spending by stages of the data science lifecycle. On the reuse graph, I can get a feel for how we're doing at creating and using reusable assets because I want to prevent my team from wasting their time reinventing the wheel. On the collaboration graph, I can look at the number of comments and the number of commenters over time. This helps me know whether my socially recluse data scientists, oh, no offense, Avinash and Miller, are collaborating together on their data science work. In a nutshell, being able to manage my projects, track my production assets, and monitor my organizational health requires new tools. The unique features you've just seen were built specifically with data science leaders in mind. Okay, all of what I've shown you in my spiel up here has been just some of what Domino has been up to. Here at Rev, you can get a hands-on preview of these new features at one of our product stations. You can check your phone uh, for the electronic agenda, or you can talk to one of our staff members to find out more about how to do that. I wanna leave you with this thought. Hopefully what we've shown you will convince you that you can count on us to be continually improving on the foundations of our platform 
while at the same time thinking to the future, collaborating closely with our customers to bring you innovations that will help all of us to be more model driven. Thank you, and Nick, turn it back over to you. Mike on. Uh, thanks, and can we just do one more round of applause for doing, they did a live demo. It really, really was live, it was good. Okay, uh, if, you, if you liked what you saw there, I've got some good news for everybody. Today we are also launching a trial environment, so everyone can go sign up and try out new functionality you just saw. The experiment manager and activity feed in, in, our, in, our, in the Domino Lab are there today. Uh, and as we release new functionality, we're gonna roll it out into that trial environment as it becomes generally available. Second quick announcement, uh, if you are existing Domino customers, we've got good news for you as well. We're also launching an online community. This is a place for you all to exchange uh, best practices, tips, tricks, advice, ask and answer questions, uh, even across uh, organizations uh, if, you're not, if you're not part of the same organization. So you can all benefit from each other's uh, collective knowledge. And uh, the community's just getting started. It's still young and early, and we'd really appreciate all your help uh, seeding it and, and getting, it to be, um, getting it to be going and active. Okay, well today um, I talked a lot about how to become a model-driven business, and I know that some of what I said is easier said than done. And that's exactly why we created Rev. We looked out in the world and we didn't see any other forum or community for data science leaders like yourselves to come together and learn from each other and exchange ideas and work through the problems that you're all gonna face along the journey. And so over the next couple of days, I would encourage you to take advantage of that unprecedented density of wisdom and experience in the room around you right now. Start up an impromptu conversation, make a new colleague, make a new friend even. We talked about data science and, and, you know, and I said that oftentimes in research, the best ideas come when you don't expect them from an impromptu, nonlinear uh, insight or contribution. And so I hope that over the next two days, every one of you will have some moment like that, some unexpected, nonlinear insight that comes from a colleague uh, that gives you the breakthrough you need to propel you forward on your journey to become model-driven. Thanks very much and have a great next two days.